One week ago uh, today, I was right now, one week ago today, I was preaching in the Bahamas. And now I'm looking out the window and saying, what happened? You know, 16 degrees. Um, no, really, I'm thankful to be here. I'm really thankful. I'm so grateful. I was thinking about this morning. I'm so grateful that God has uh, called me and placed me to be here as a pastor at Christ Church. And it's great to be with you today. So I'm happy to be back. And we're starting this new series today called The One, which we're going to get to in just a moment. Let's pray once more, um, at least once more. Let's pray and just ask God to speak to us through this message. Father, thank you for um, this opportunity to be a part of this community, to be in this place right now, and to sing these songs, and to pray these prayers, and to see the faces of one another. It's a, it's a good thing. And God, as we get into this passage, Luke 15 today, I pray that you would speak to our hearts. You would teach us about who you are and how we're called to live. We ask us all this in the name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Uh, can you think of a person in your life who's been a, a great example of friendship? Can you, can you think of that kind of person? What, what makes that person such a good example of friendship? I think of a person, when I, when I think about that question, I think of a guy named Bill Jurgens. Bill's been a friend for, for a long time. And I've got a lot of memories with Bill. For instance, one time uh, I helped him uh, demo his kitchen. I am not the kind of person you want to come and help you like make your new kitchen, but demo it. I can help with that. I helped build demos kitchen. Uh, he got tickets to see the Steelers play their last home game in Three River Stadium. I think that was 1999. He took me to that game. That was a blast. That was a lot of fun. Uh, Bill was a guy who was a musician. Bill loved to worship, and so I've, I've sang with Bill. In fact, in the context of the church, we sang together some really good times. Um, Bill, his wife, he and his wife would have these incredible New Year's Eve parties, epic, uh, really enjoyed those parties, so good. And then, you know, I just think about being in his backyard. Bill was great about opening his home, and uh, I could picture our family sitting together around a fire pit, just kicking it and having a good time. Just great memories of Bill, and I'm thankful for those. But, but, but the fun memories, all that kind of stuff, isn't alone what makes Bill, to me, such a great example of friendship. Bill is the kind of guy that if I was struggling with something, I could go to Bill and I would get some insight. I'd get some wisdom from him. Bill is the kind of guy that if I was uh, feeling overwhelmed about something, I could, I could turn to him and he'd pray for me. Bill, Bill was the kind of person that if, if I was challenged in any kind of way, I, I, do you have people like this? I could go to Bill, and I would, I would tell him what the challenge is. I'm really so grateful for that. And, and here's the thing about Bill. Whenever I would come with my struggle, my challenge, whatever it was, he would pull no punches. He wouldn't pull any punches. He would be totally honest with me, and he would tell me the truth about myself, what he was seeing, and about the circumstances that I found myself in. And I think that's really at the heart of what makes a good friend. He was honest with me. And he would confront me. That's an interesting thing when you think of a friend that way. He would confront me and challenge me. And, 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 and the deal is this. Despite the fact that, that he would challenge me, I never ever doubted for one moment that, that Bill loved me like a brother. He absolutely did. And I totally felt safer on him. I could tell him anything. In fact, I did tell him everything. And, and that was a safe place to be. That kind of friend. Do you have that kind of friend? The, the passage we're going to look at today gives us a glimpse into an unexpected friendship. We're looking at the passage uh, that's, that's really famous, Luke 15. And in Luke 15, well, I want to read the first two verses for you because I want you to hear this. I, th I think this is phenomenal. In the context of everything else we're going to hear are, are these opening statements. Listen to this, okay? So the, the, the chapter begins this way. This is the context of what we're going to see today in, in the Scripture. Verse 1, the tax collectors and the sinners 
were all gathering around to hear Jesus. Don't you love that? It, it wasn't the church people. It wasn't the, the highly religious. Who was gathering around to hear Jesus? The tax collectors, people who were hated, and the sinners. So listen, we're in good company today. If, you, if you've come into church and you're like, oh man, I feel a little awkward here. I wonder if you ever hear someone say, I think the roof might cave in if I come in. Maybe I'll get struck by lightning. No, you won't. Because, because Jesus is totally comfortable with tax collectors and sinners. He's comfortable with you. It's, and then it says this, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered to themselves. They're, they're muttering under their breath and they said, this man welcomes sinners and he eats with them. <laughs> I love it. Don't you love that that this testimony given to Jesus, testimony about Jesus given by his enemies, what do they say? That he eats with tax collectors, he eats with sinners, he welcomes them. It's spoken with scorn. These, these, ta- these, these religious leaders, they're scornfully referring to Jesus as someone who hangs out with the wrong people. They look at this as a bad thing. But what they don't realize is this, is that it's to be admired. They couldn't understand that a person of Jesus' stature would be hanging out with with people who are broken, people who were dirty, people who were sinful. They couldn't understand how someone of his repute would hang out with people like that. But what was intended to be a condemnation? That's what they were there. They were, they were condemning Jesus. What was intended to be a condemnation actually highlights. It speaks of the mission of Jesus, his purpose. Man, people get it wrong, I think, when they think about Jesus. He, he is a friend of sinners. That's what it says. That's what the scripture says. If you went back a few pages, and you have to read the scriptures like as a whole. If you went back to Luke chapter 7. Verse 34, you'd see there that Jesus is referred to. It's one of two times. He's a friend of sinners. Mm, warms my heart. He is a friend of sinners. And that's the, the Savior we're talking about today. We're talking about a Savior who, who loves the person who is lost. Um, we're going to be in Luke 15 today, as I've mentioned. And Luke 15 contains three stories that Jesus told that are among the most vivid, meaningful, uh, memorable stories that are told in the entire Bible. This is one of those chapters, of all the chapters in the Scripture, that really stands out. And, And there are three stories told within Luke 15 that all make a similar point. The three stories, by the way, are the story of the lost sheep, the story of the lost coin, and the story of the lost son or the prodigal son. We're going to talk about the first two today, not the prodigal son. I would love to get that one another time, but today we're going to talk about the first two. And the deal is this. They all make a similar point. And here's the point. They're throwing a strong light, a bright light on Jesus' desire, his willingness to rescue, to save sinners. That's what this is about. That They condemn Jesus for, for hanging out with sinners, he says, you know what, let me tell you, 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 you've got it all wrong. This is why I came, actually. You think this is something that's wrong about me. It's actually what's exactly right about me. You see, God's love, God's love, here's what the story is saying, is a love that works. It's a love that's active. That's the kind of love that God has for us. He, he, didn't, he didn't sit in heaven like a shepherd crying over sheep that are lost. He didn't sit in heaven like a woman who lost a coin, fretting over the fact that he lost the coin. He doesn't just sit there and complain and moan and, and weep about it. No, we have the kind of God, the kind of Savior, who doesn't sit in heaven and just pity us. He doesn't just pity sinners. He actually gets up. He left heaven. He left eternity with his father. This is what Jesus has done. And he came down to the world. And why does he come? To seek and to save the lost. Jesus, whoo, he is a friend of sinners. And if that doesn't pique your interest, if that doesn't make you say, I want to know more, I don't know what will. 
Jesus never rested in his earthly ministry until he had paid for sins, till he had made atonement for your sin and for my sin. So here's what I want to do. I want to show you through these first two stories, the lost sheep and the lost coin. I want to show you how Jesus befriends sinners. I want you to see this. And I pray you'll be encouraged by it. Let's let's do this. Then we'll look at how we can do the same. Let's first look at how Jesus befriends sinners. Uh, Pick up in verse 3 of Luke 15. You can follow along on the screen. If you have a Bible, you can read along there. I encourage you to jot down some things that maybe God brings to your attention here. Jesus told them this parable. They accuse him of hanging out with sinners. And so he says, let me tell you a story. Here's the story. Suppose one of you has 100 sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. And then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me! I have found my lost sheep! I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Okay, so here you have the shepherd and the sheep. And and sheep are used throughout the scriptures to illustrate the human predicament. And I think it it does it aptly. It made me think of a video I saw on social media a while ago. I want to show you this little clip. I think you might identify with this. I identify with this. Show them that clip, please. A second time, just a slow motion, right? Because I hate to break this to you, but that's you. That's you. And that's me. And and the reason that the scriptures over and over again talk about shepherds and sheep because in God's view we're kind of like that you know you know sheep um, sheep have a tendency to, to 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 wander from one place to another and it's like they wander because they're short-sighted they can't see very far in front of them and, and they're just going from one like piece of grass to another and they wander they don't have like a vision for where they're headed and they lose sight of the fact that they're straying away from the rest of the fold. And before they know it, they're, they're caught in a ditch. They're lost. And, and I think in a loving way, this is the way that, that Jesus speaks of us. Lost sheep. Who, who just can't quite see that far in front of them. Don't take this as an insulting thing. It's more of a, a loving sense of communicating with us. But, but here's what happens to the sheep who just go astray and, and get lost and wander off. The shepherd goes after the sheep. That, that's, that's the story. Jesus says, hey, let me tell you, you see me hanging out with the tax collectors and the sinners? Let me tell you, the, the, the shepherd goes after the lost sheep. That's what a good shepherd does. And Jesus, by the way, is the good shepherd. He's telling a story that very much points to who he is. And, and, you know, Jesus, during his day, he hung out with people who had a bad reputation. He he spent time with people who, who you wouldn't think that a religious leader, so to speak, would hang out with. Jesus associated with the most blatant non-believers of his time yeah tax collectors people of ill repute people who who were on the margins of life outcast those are the kind of people that jesus the savior found himself And, and i'll point this out to you also though because i think some people hear that about jesus and it's like yeah jesus my homeboy right he he hung out with with the people who 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 didn't fit in and that is true but but don't take that and twist it 
Because I'll also tell you what Jesus wasn't doing. Jesus wasn't just just how to have a good time. Jesus wasn't just going with the flow. Jesus wasn't simply uh, hanging out like some frat boy. That was not what he was doing. Jesus was very much active. He was not passive. He did not sin. And he was on mission. Jesus Christ when hanging out with the tax collectors and the sinners and the people that, that were thought to be outcasts, was very much actively seeking the salvation of sinful people. That is what he was doing. I want to read you a quote that maybe will help. I thought this was a good quote and, and um, I, I think will help us understand the, the complexity of the shepherd going to look for the sheep. Jesus, the friend of sinners. Listen to this. This is by a guy named... John Bartunek, and he says this, Jesus' first priority was bringing people back into communion with God, showing them the Father's love, and teaching them the way to fullness of life. He asked that we do the same. We like to think that other people's lives are their business, and it's our job to stay quiet, but that is not what we read in the scriptures. What's not your business is judging harshly, publicly shaming, putting yourself on a pedestal, or rejecting another. However, as a member of the Christian community, it is your business to go after someone when you see them headed for trouble, pointing out sinful behavior with great care and humility is doing the Lord's work which for the record, rarely feels easy, but is always worth it. That's a good quote. And I love it. You know, Jesus wasn't just hanging with the popular in crowd. That wasn't his point. He was there to to gently and humbly and with great care point out the, the sinful behavior of humanity. And not just to point it out from a pedestal, but to reach down and to help that human, that person, humanity, out of the ditch, out of the, 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 the crevice that they've fallen into, and to get them back up. That's the kind of Savior we have. And let me bring it back to, to you and Jesus. Because Jesus is your shepherd. Make no mistake, when we read this text, Jesus is your shepherd. He's my shepherd. And he's searching for you. He's looking for you. If you come in here today, lost, wandered off, in a ditch, let me show you the picture from that, that video you saw before, before I got up here. Show them that picture. I want you to see this. I think this picture really encompasses well what we're talking about here. Jesus wants to rescue you. Leave it up there. He knows the place that you've been scattered to, where you've wandered off. He knows your sin. And, and I want to tell you this. As you look at this picture, Jesus will not leave you. He's not content to leave you in that place. Like my friend Bill, who would tell me the truth about myself. Jesus will not be content to leave you there, but you don't have to hide. You don't have to hide. He will pick you up, just like you see in that picture. And he'll carry you to safety. He'll teach you. I love the way that the passage puts it. The passage says that the shepherd puts the sheep on his shoulders as if it's, it's a prized creature and carries it in. That's the kind of Savior we have, the one who put the cross on his shoulders for you and for me. How does Jesus befriend the sinners? It's like a shepherd with the sheep. Let's continue on. Let's see, because there's more. I want you to see another dimension it's like the scriptures are, I was telling a friend on Friday, it's like, it's like this passage is like a diamond, and when you look at it in different light, you see different dimension and aspects of the beauty of this gem of a story. So let's, let's look more at the one who befriends sinners. You, you hear about the shepherd and the sheep. Now look at this, the parable of the lost coin. Verse 8, suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? 
And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Okay, so the sheep illustrate the human predicament. I think they do that well. The coin also illustrates the human predicament. I mean, think about this, okay? So here I have a coin, and let's say that that coin gets lost, okay? When that coin is lost, think about it. Can that coin help itself? No, of course not. That, that coin cannot get itself off the ground and back into my hand. It doesn't work that way. The, the, can't, the, the, the coin can't even bleat like a sheep. You know, at least the sheep could say, bah, right? This, this coin can do nothing on its own. And spiritually speaking, hear me, spiritually speaking, this is us. We cannot will ourselves back into the fold. We can't will ourselves to be found. The, the coin can't do that on its own. We, we can't do that on our own. Not only that, we're incapable of rising to meet God's holy standard. We, we cannot do that on our own. Only Jesus, only a Savior can rescue us. Only a Savior can reach down from heaven and pick us up, so to speak. This is what the Savior does. This is how he befriends sinners. Christ is the one who finds the lost sinner. He, he rescues us. He pardons us. I like that word. He pardons us for our, our sins. The things that have caused you to wander off or to be lost, we, we actually have a Savior who, who gives us pardon. And he sanctifies us. This is where maybe the challenge comes in. He'll point out things lovingly, gently, humbly about you and about me. And he'll sanctify us. Only Jesus is, does this kind of work. He, he will secure for you eternity. This is the work of the Savior. This is what Jesus does. And, and he came, listen, he came not for the righteous. Jesus came to save who? Sinners. Sinners, he is emphatically, he is emphatically a friend of sinners. This is what Jesus was on earth. He was a friend of sinners. This is what he is right now at this moment on the right, at the right hand of God. He sits as a friend of sinners today for you. And listen, he'll do that for all of eternity. Jesus is the friend of of sinners. Oof, oof, amen. I hope that you're getting like the goosebumps on your arms. I hope you feel this because it's so true. Um, I know this is true. Th there are many here today. I'm looking across the room and I see some faces I know. I see some faces I don't know. And, and please don't take this as like any kind of like harsh statement. I know that today that many have come in here carrying a sense of sin. And maybe you're ashamed of, of your behavior in the past. Perhaps you, you're, you feel haunted by some decision you've made along the way. And you feel stuck like a coin that can't get off the ground. You don't have to feel that way. Because the way that the Savior befriends us, the way he does it, is he, he will come after you. If you've got some kind of memory of, of your behavior in your life that's bitter. You can let that go. You can let go of the shame. In fact, I would say this, you, if you feel that way, if you feel the burden of sin, if you feel broken, if you feel lost, you are exactly the person that should be turning to Jesus. What are you waiting for? Don't, don't delay. Don't put it off. What are you afraid of? We're talking about a God. What, what other world religion proclaims such a statement, friend of sinners? This is who Jesus is. And, and, and I would call, tell you, don't delay it. Come just as you are. D don't try to somehow get yourself into the hand of God. Understand he reaches down and he'll pick you up. This is the heart of, of Jesus, the shepherd, the one who looks for the lost coin and and Jesus, 
the friend of sinners, exemplifies a self-sacrificing love. This is how he accomplishes his work. You know, just like the shepherd. The shepherd uh, brought the sheep home on his shoulders. He was not content to leave the sheep where it was. That's, that's when he wouldn't do that. The woman spared no effort in finding the coin. God will not stop until he finds you. Jesus didn't just sit in heaven. He didn't spare himself at all to save sinners. He endured the cross. He endured the humiliation of the cross. And he laid down his life, who? For his friends. This is great love. There's no greater love than you could see than the one who is the friend of the sinner and comes to you. So here's what I want to do. In a couple minutes I have remaining here. I, I want to make this practical for us, okay? And Because and, I think it's not only, you know, understanding what, what God has done through Christ and befriending sinners and how he does that, but I also want all of us to see today how we can join Jesus in being like him and also being the friend of the sinner because that's what we're called to do. I think that's another aspect of this story. And so just as Jesus has befriended us, we're called to do the same. And, and Christians pattern themselves. We pattern our lives after the example of Jesus. So just as he was sent, we are sent. And, and we have the same Holy Spirit, the same presence of God in us. We have the same mission. And just like him, we are called to, to be the friend of sinners. Well, how can we do that? There's a lot of things we could say here. I'm just going to share three tips with you. There are a lot more. In fact, I'm sure in conversations, I'll hear some ideas and thoughts you have on this. But let me just share with you three tips, okay? The first tip is this. Um, get comfortable in the margins. If, if you want to be a friend of sinners, if you want to follow the mission of Jesus, get comfortable in the margins, okay? In other words, be okay with associating with those who are kind of on the fringes. Jesus was very much at ease on the fringes. In fact, he was criticized for this. And so Jesus uh, was constantly aware of those who were overlooked, those who were poor, those who uh, were, 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 were um, cast off by society, those who were hurting. And so find those people. And by the way, they're always in our circles. The students, they're, they're at school. The people in the outcast that, that maybe you tend to stay away from, they're the very people that, that Christ wants you to seek out and save because that's his heart. He's the friend of sinners. In your workplace, that, that guy that, that no one else wants to talk to, the, go and, and be with that person. This is the heart of Jesus. Jesus sought out those who no one else wanted to be around. And so you have to be comfortable on the margins. Uh, go there, be with them. Be with this people. Spend time with them. Learn from them. This is one of the aspects of Choices Pregnancy Center that I love. Choices is very much comfortable in the margins. Very much comfortable with people that, that don't have anywhere else to turn, who don't have a leg to stand on on their own. It's a good example for us. We're called to be people who are comfortable in the margins. And I would say there's another aspect of being comfortable in the margins. And it's not just being comfortable with those who are on the margins, who are in the margins. It's being comfortable in being in the margins yourself. Okay? Being comfortable in the margins yourself because if you are going to follow Christ, understand that Jesus was very much in the margins. He, he also was cast out. The power brokers of the day, he wasn't one of them. Not from an earthly perspective. He wasn't accepted by the powers that be, by the in crowd. And so we should expect not to be two. Not only do we have, to have a heart for the people in the margins, we have to expect ourselves to be in the margins. If, if you are going to associate with people in the margins, then you have to understand that, that, that when you go and see people who are headed for trouble, 
and you reach down to pick them up, then, then you also will be considered on the margins. And people will say things like, oh man, those people are, you're so non-progressive. And people will, will chide you for your, your, your lack of understanding of sexual modernity. And, and you'll be thought to be backwater. And you'll be looked down upon. This is the cost of being in the margins and being willing to speak truth and to live out the call of Jesus and to be a friend of sinners. People will think you're weird. People will think you're stupid. People will think that you're judgmental. All those kinds of things. Get comfortable in the margins. And, and, and I will remind you of this. Calling it like it is or just following the call of Jesus doesn't live or die by societal acceptance. That's not the way this works. And so please, wrestle with this. The lost won't be found without someone risking it. Risking it by taking the gospel in uncomfortable ways to uncomfortable places. We have to see that when we see Jesus. Oh, I pray we'll be a church like that that's not afraid to be in the margins. Okay, so that's one tip. Okay, I spent a lot of time there. Let's go quickly to the second tip. The second tip is this. Um, The second tip is join Jesus in what he is already doing. So I said to get comfortable in the margins. The second part is this. God's at work. God's at work in your life, and he is at work. Because he's the friend of sinners, he's at work in the life of someone who is not yet aware of God's presence in their life, or doesn't yet call Jesus their Savior, he's at work in their life because he's the friend of sinners. That's who he is. And so here's what God calls you to do. He calls you to join him in that work, to be awakened to the mission of God. It's happening all around you. It's happening in your workplace. Yeah, it's happening in your school. God's mission is alive, and it's awake there, and he wants you to join in. So one of my friends is uh, John Guest, who is our pastor here for a long time, and from my friend, and so it's really a privilege to call John a friend. Uh, from my friend John, I've learned this. John has told me, and I've witnessed him do this, that he's always thinking about, he's trained himself to always be thinking about what God wants to do in the person's life that he is sitting across from, whom he's in the presence of. And so whether that person's a part of the church or not, John's always thinking, okay, what is this person's next move? What what does God have for them? And how can I be an encouragement to that? How can I be a help to to that move that God has? That's, that's, That's a shepherd's heart. That's the heart of one who's looking for the lost coin. And God calls you and I to be on mission with him. So so listen, be awakened to that mission. Join God in what he's doing. Be comfortable in the margins. That's one tip. Second tip, uh, be awakened to the mission that God's at work around you. And then the third one is this. I, I think this is important. Breathe in and loosen up. Breathe in and loosen up. Here's what I mean. Okay, so I've got a friend. His name is Matt Davis. Matt Davis is a good guy, a friend of mine in the church here, and he heads up a ministry called 412 Sports Ministries. You should check it out. Really great ministry. It's gotten off the ground in the last year. And uh, Matt and I were texting just a few days ago, actually. We were texting about baseball. We were talking about um, the way that a person approaches the plate when, when they're coming to bat. I know you're like, this is what dudes text about? Yes, we were texting about this. Let me read to you um, the text. I thought Matt said some really interesting things that made me think about this message. Here's what Matt said. I asked him about, you know, we were talking about how you grip the bat, how you grip the bat. He said this. He said, grip is super important, not just how tight or loose you hold the bat, but also how you do it. He talked about how you're supposed to line up the, the knuckles that you would knock on a door with, which a lot of people don't get, but that allows for more rotation in your wrist. And then he said this, he said, too tight a grip grip will restrict your range of motion and therefore your ability to hit certain pitchers and your ability to hit them properly. Grip should be firm enough to control the bat, but loose enough to allow for a full range of motion in your swing. I think it'd also be a reflection of the mentality of the hitter too. If you're tense in the box, then you're going to grip the bat too tightly because you're either terrified or you're trying to do too much. Okay, so 
So this is metaphorical, right? And if you're not a sports person, don't get lost in that because I want you to hear the, the greater point, which is this. Hey, don't white knuckle it when it comes to your relationships. Some, some of you are trying to squeeze so hard and, 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 you're, and you're so tense about the whole thing that it comes off awkwardly and you're going you're gonna to swing and miss. You're just going to be fouling off pitches at best. Take a deep breath and relax because here's, here's the deal. When it comes to befriending sinners, it's not on you to be their savior. It's not on you to be the person who is the salvation for another person. Simply relax as you stand in the box, so to speak. Breathe in and allow the good shepherd, the Holy Spirit, to work in you and through you. So just a few tips, right? How do you befriend people? Hey, loosen up, relax, get on mission. Be comfortable with people in the margins. There's just a few ways we could do that. I want to wrap this up. You know, you, you probably picked up. I was talking about my friend Bill, and you probably picked up. I was speaking about Bill um, in the past tense. Bill went to be with the Lord last year. He's a great guy. He's amazing. Some of you know Bill. And Bill, um, he was only 58 years old. Big family. Six kids and a bunch of grandkids already. And he's missed dearly by all of them. And he's missed dearly by anyone who called him a friend. He was such an awesome man. And there's, there's a large part of me that wishes, and, and I know you feel this way about your loved ones too. I, I wish that I could sit down with Bill again and share some of the stuff that, that I'm thinking about. I wish that I could go in the backyard and enjoy a night at the fire pit. I wish that we could worship again together. But we can't. That opportunity isn't there for us anymore. And here's the realization that I have come to. And the realization is this. That it's my turn. It's my turn to be a friend like Bill Jurgens was to someone. It's my turn to, to be the kind of person who will love them, challenge them. And it's your turn too. And this, just, this isn't just sentimentality. This is from the scriptures because we read about, we read about here in the scriptures about, about the one who, who calls us to follow his example, to seek and save the lost, to be a friend of sinners. And so, hey, we called the series the one. Let me ask you a question. I think you get it now. The shepherd left, the 99 went after the one. Who is your one? Who, who is someone that you're praying for? That, that you're willing to befriend, even if they're far from God, even if they're stuck in some kind of crevice somewhere, who, who is it? Who's the one in your life? I want to give you an opportunity to pray right now. And as we pray, I want you to think about that question, who is the one? But another thing I want to think about is this. Do you have a friendship with God through Jesus? Do you desire to have that kind of friendship? You could turn to him today. Let's pray right now. Would you bow your heads? Let's turn to the Lord now. Father, we, we thank you for this great picture of Jesus, the good shepherd, the one who seeks furiously after the lost, the one who uh, is a friend of sinners. God, I'm thankful for that. I'm humble and I recognize that I'm a sinner and I need that friendship. If there's anyone here, while our eyes are closed, our heads are bowed, if there's anyone here today who desires to have the friendship of God, maybe you've never, ever expressed that to God and said, God, I, I, I desire a friendship with you. I need, I need the one who's the friend of the sinner. Would you raise your hand? I want to give an opportunity today to say yes to Jesus. Just put your hand in the air. If you desire to have a friendship with the Lord, you can have that. God sees that hand. He sees you. And he knows you and he loves you. And he is the friend of sinners. I pray you'll feel that, God, for those who have raised their hands here today, I pray, God, that you would meet them in the midst of this and they would know that, that they have a friend in you. I pray they would repent. They turn away from their sin. They turn toward you. Simply saying, God, I believe in Jesus. 
I believe in the good shepherd, the son of God, who paid for my sins and rose again. Thank you, God, for being my friend. It's the beginning of a relationship. And if there's anyone here who has a heart for the one, who's got someone in their life that, that you feel like God's telling you to, to pursue, to go after, to be a part, to join him in his rescue mission. If you've got someone, like I want to pray for you, would you raise your hand if you've got someone in your mind, someone in your heart, just put your hands up. I'd love to pray with you as you're thinking about the one in your life. God, there are many people here who have their hands up and they want to join you in being a friend to the sinner. I pray, God, that you would strengthen them and help them. God, help them to, to not try too hard. I pray that they would uh, breathe in and relax. I pray, God, that, that they would join you simply at what you're already doing and they'd be comfortable in the margins. Give them your strength, Lord. Help them as they join you on your rescue mission to seek and save sinners. Thank you, God, that you've sought us out and you've loved us. Thank you for this, this word. And I pray, God, as we leave from here today, Lord, that we remember that we have a friend, a friend of sinners in Jesus Christ. All this in his name we pray. Amen. Amen.